normal, speech, etc., which are positive as well. But if you look at the whole African scene, party politics most likely divides people. Families don't even talk because this one belongs to party, this one belongs to party. What I'm suggesting is that we should be able, in the light of our experiences, to carve for ourselves a model that satisfies our own aspirations. We should learn, take notes from others' experiences, but we should not just take everything and say that because it is from there, it is the best. We should learn to sift. We should learn to analyze. We should learn to look at ourselves from our own history, look at the composition of our family units, and as a result of that, fashion out a system that can well serve us. So I'm not condemning multi-party democracy. I'm saying that we should be able to fashion something out of this based on our own experiences. Then the other medium, if you like, by which we've been subjugated over the period is in the media, the media. You know, you are bombarded every day with information, propaganda, etc. That does not serve your own purpose. I'm sure before some of you came here, you were told that Africa is a horrible place. Yes. Civil wars, disease, everything. Yeah, but I'm sure when you came to Ghana, no, they are killing other people in other democracies. <coughs> but when it happens in Africa, there is ritual murder. But when somebody takes the pistols and guns down 10 people, oh, it's shooting spree. <laughs> So these are the things. We're saying that the, the language that is used, the way it is carved or crafted as a design, this is what we should be reading in the life. So that we don't suffer or need to solve that kind of So our policies are directed towards the process of decolonization, mental, the mental enslavement we have gone through something that we want to free ourselves from. And I'm saying it's not easy because the slave master will not tell the slave, you are free, go away. You have to fight. You fight and even die before you can win your freedom. So that is the struggle. It's a struggle. Then what do we use culture for? We use culture also to create unity. You know, Ghana and Togo, they are Aves. They are Aves beyond the border. And they are Aves in Ghana. But when they were carving the territories, they made sure they carved it. They divided two families, literally. You know, and they put a stiff boundary. And the colonial master for Togo is uh, French, and the, the, the French government, whilst Ghana is the British government. And French, British, their systems are slightly different. So you create a wedge between families. One is French, one is English speaking. And uh, every time they are promoting what we call conflicts. This one wants to overthrow it, this one wants to overthrow it. So the borders are always closed. You never have the opportunity of even visiting your family. You know. So these are designs that have been put in place. So until we ourselves realize some of these things, until we ourselves realize that there is an unseen hand that is manipulating you so that you can always have conflict. And you see, what is very interesting is that at the end of the day, they promote the conflict, they sell arms to you to kill, and the later they come and say, we are talking about peace. So somebody sits in the plane and junkets from one region to the other, supposedly promoting peace, whilst their own people are busy selling arms, and uh, we are told the governments are not aware, but they are aware. You know, so it's a big design. We need to be alert to all of this. So we use culture to create unity in diversity. The reason why we also mention diversity is that, you see, every group of people have something that is unique and something that is slightly different, even though we are in the same environment, slightly different from the other cultural grouping. We are all in Ghana. We are Ghanaians. But I can bet you, if you move from here and you go to Volta region, their cultural practices, their rites of passage, which my colleague will be dealing with in detail, their everything, their naming ceremony, is slightly different from what happens in the north. 
Our chiefs, the way we install our chiefs in the south, it's slightly different from what happens in the north. In the north, they talk about skins. In the south, we talk about tools. Though we are all in Ghana, there are slight differences. And it's, we want to recognize these diversities, respect them, yet in the midst of these diversities, we talk about unity. It's a very complex arrangement, but we have to try and achieve it. What we're trying to promote is to promote, to respect the cultural, the cultural diversities of the various groupings within a whole. Because there's no way you can try to walk over somebody's aspirations, somebody's way of doing things. No. You have to respect it, even his language. And there are moves to promote minority languages. The language factor is also very important. So you respect all this within a certain whole. So that is what our cultural policies are directed to us. That's why we have a policy in place to guide us in our actions. Then we also need to use our cultural policy to create what we call confidence. Our problem is lack of what? Confidence. Why is it that somebody who is black, and some of us can be very black, would want to turn that skin into a white skin, you know? It means that something has gone wrong somewhere. And there are, there are institutions, there are, there are conglomerates who are prepared to sell bleaching. Uh, this thing. Yes, so that you can bleach your skin, get cancer, yet you are deceiving yourself that you want to look bright. You know, it's what we call crisis in our confidence level. We are not confident. That is a result of colonialism. They have been telling you that you don't matter, you know. And that is, it has these economic implications. You don't have confidence in your own goods. You don't have confidence in your clothes. You don't have confidence in your ideas. You don't have confidence in even your traditional institutions, you know. So what you do is to constantly look abroad for something that comes from outside your region. That's Africa. You know, it has an economic implication. So it is serving the interests of a certain group of people. It's well designed, supported, implemented, and funded. You know, so today when you have World Bank support in a certain area, if you read between the lines, you see the, the unseen hand trying to direct affairs. And I'm saying that you need to be very intense in analyzing. You need to be nationalistic to see some of these unseen hands at work. It's a very difficult process. Now, so, uh, we're also saying that if we need to build confidence in our people, we also need to protect some of our treasured values. Our chief Tansi Panafinelia. The chief comes out in a gorgeous manner, his clothes, his language stuff, his, his, all those things have meanings. The stuff that they carry has meaning. You know, before, before this society was one which was oral based, a lot of history, a lot of things was transmitted by way of mouth and designs and pictures and things. You know, if there's a carving here, it speaks volumes. Because that is how they were preserving this, uh, this knowledge, this store of knowledge from one generation to the other. So all these things are complex things that had meaning. You know, but somewhere along the line, oh, they were condemned as non-entities. But today you can be surprised that the same people who are coming behind the scenes to buy some of these rare artifacts to go and adorn their museums. You know? So it's a complex thing that is happening. Now, the other important thing is what we call value. What are our value systems? What are they? I'll just give you an example. For us in Africa and for that matter in Ghana, marriage is a very sacred institution. You don't normally, you don't normally have to go before the altar, the priest will come and bless you before we recognize marriage in the traditional sector. For us, marriage is between families. An African or a Ghanaian would normally not go walk to the register general or to the police. Look, we are three in number. Can you bless us here? No. Marriage is arranged between families. 
family A, family B, and it's not even, most times, it's not even the young man who does the thing. The young man may have seen the lady is interested, but it's the family that arranges the marriage. Because within that marriage are systems and procedures for conflict resolution. Before you move to marry A, you need, the, you need to be told the history of that family. Are there traces of disease in that family? Is there a mental problem in that family? Are they criminals? There are certain families that are noted for constant divorce. They will marry three days, divorce the next day. No, you need to know all these things. And the family will sit down and say, yes, this is a good breed. We want our family to enter into an alliance with that family. So the family arranges a systematic way of having that thing consummated. So when there are problems, it is the same family that sits down to resolve it. That's why we used to have a very low rate of divorce, because it is the families, they have a conflict resolution mechanism embedded in that uh, institution. So every time we are trying to solve problems. But today, people just are no more interested. The families are not even informed. You know, in the typical African home, when you, the lady, you are dissatisfied with the marriage, you pack your things back into your father's house. You'll be sent back the next day, you know, because they try to find out the cause. If it, you are the problem, you'll be advised, you'll be told what to do. So part of the thing that happens is that once you are a lady right from the day start, you are, you are prepared to assume the responsibility, not only because you want to marry, because the woman has a very important place in our society. It's the woman that runs the home, and everything, you know. Only that these days they are trying to define it within certain dimensions. But in the traditional home, the woman is the foreigner. She takes everything in the home. The, the, the character of the child is molded by the woman. So you see that our institutions, our value systems are in place. But I'm, again, I'm saying that they are all under attack these days because we are importing systems that do not necessarily blend with our philosophy. But we are grappling with those ones gradually. And then one of our value systems is the, 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 the respect for, not for authority, authoritarian authority, but respect for the elder, the elderly. You know, you see somebody who is older than you, you need to respect that person, you need to listen to that person. Because there is something that person knows which you are yet to know. So you listen. You give that person the respect. You, you, you see an elderly person standing up and you privilege enough to have a seat. Oh, please, kindly take this seat. You have blessing. You know. Those are the things we value. In Africa, in Ghana, we don't use the left to greet. Yes. There will be cultural differences, but we here. If I see a young Ghanaian boy using the left to even collect something from him, I slap the hand and say, use your right. There are things that we need to instill into the child so that as he grows, he can, can behave normally when the peers are, are, are meeting. Other than that, you'll be seen as somebody who has not had the normal training from the home. So these are things that are very, very important. So why don't you also have saints? You should have black saints. Don't you agree? Yes, so these are the things. Gradually, we shall be getting there. So, what is the role of culture between us on the continent and our brothers in the diaspora? We have to use culture to build bridges. Our messages, our dance forms, the lyrics in our music, <coughs> Our <clears throat> art forms, everything has to encourage the building of bridges between us here and our brothers and sisters like you who are coming from UK with different cultural backgrounds. We have to achieve that even before the politicians think of doing it, we are already doing it. We sit together, we dialogue, we dance, we perform. Yesterday there was a very, a very unique presentation that's the audience participation, you know. And the, at the end of the day, everybody was happy in that room. Are we not breaking barriers? We are. If you had some very negative ideas about me, and you see that we could all come together and dance, 
are we not solving some of those problems? So for us, it's a very important thing that happened yesterday, and we think this should continue. I will end here. If there are questions, I'll take them so that my colleague can also look at the specific areas of the rights of passage. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, there are books um, offhand now. I, I can't tell you, but I can later on, after this, uh, we can take down address. Uh, we're going to do a lot more of this thing and then give you some of these books that you can get. They are, yeah, look, some of some some Europeans have written books on Africa which are quite revealing. You know, some of them do not necessarily follow the patterns of their government. There are some of them who are really, really, you know, correct upstairs. And they have seen some of the harm that have been done to Africa, and they are trying to correct them. So we we'll try and get to a list of some of these books and some pamphlets uh, which we can lay our hands on. <clears throat> Good, so my colleague can. Maybe after that, we can still ask questions. Yes. I'm going to deal with rise of passage. Now, in our Ghanaian community, we see life as a continuous process. Life is dynamic, it's not static. So every aspect of our lives should be marked with an activity, a very unique activity. And these rights are features that will prepare you from one generation into another generation. These are the rights of passing. The first one is the naming ceremony. You know, a woman is pregnant for nine months. And during that period of the nine months, the woman goes through a lot of hair and then God willing, she delivers. And when she delivers, in our society, <coughs> the newly born baby is not exposed to everybody. It's not exposed because <coughs> there are people with evil intentions. At the very moment they set eye on that newly born baby, the spirit of the baby is taken. So, there are witches, there are wizards, there are a lot of evil doers who does not want that child to exist. So, the child is kept away from public view for seven days. And for these seven days, that child is not accepted into the society. It is believed that within that seven days, the child must encounter certain difficulties. Each day and each difficulty. If the child passes test one, then he moves into the next one until the seventh day is over. Then on the eighth day, it means that child has come to stay. If during the period of the seventh day, the child dies, it means he has not come to stay. So that child is not given a name. On the eighth day, after she has passed or he has passed through all the, the tests, then is fit to be given a name and then accepted into the society. Now on the eighth day, what happens? Very early in the morning, between the hours of 5 and 5.30, 
family gardens. And then the paternal uncle of the child or the paternal auntie of the child, if it is a girl, is called to come and take responsibility of outdooring this child. It is not only anybody who outdoors a baby. You must be somebody of good character so that the child will take after you. If you are a burglar, you are not recognized in society. So before somebody comes out to name a child, that person must be of good reputation, of good character. Now on that day, a lot of things happen. The child is brought out naked and then put in the open. Sometimes they throw water onto the roof to fall on the child. What does that stand for? It means the child is being introduced to rain. That in this world, you are going to be beaten by the rain. So from the word go, you must be introduced to it. That life is not going to be easy for you. The rain will beat you, but you must know that it is a blessing. Now, when the rain falls on this child, or when the water is sprinkled on this child, the child cries out. Cries out for what? For help. Then the auntie goes in and beats this child and wrap the child in a white cloth, meaning that that child is blessed and then give it to the mother. Before all these things, libation is poured. Now libation pouring is a means of prayer communicating with the God. My friend just told you that when the colonizers came, they thought the African does not have a God. We have our God. And it is the supreme God that we worship. So before anything starts, we have to seek reverence from God. So we pour libation. And in the pouring of libation, a lot of history is repeated. A lot of the ancestors that had gone by, names are mentioned to be present in spirit to witness what the naming ceremony. Now, there is another important thing. The child is introduced to what, what we call telling the truth. And how do we do this? First of all, water in a calabash. The officiating uncle dips his hand into the water and onto the tongue of the little baby. And telling that baby that this is water. If you see water, it is water. Don't mention water as drink, <coughs> as any other drink, but it is water. Telling you that you must learn to tell what? The truth. Then, after that, either gin or palm wine is also dipped into the mouth of the baby. This one is also telling you if you say drink, note the difference between drink and water. Note the difference between drink and water. If you see white, say it is white. If you see black, say it is black. So from the way go, they are introducing you to telling the truth. Don't look at something red and tell your friend that it is white. So from the way go, this value system is being introduced to you. Now sometimes in certain areas, they put salt into your mouth that salt tastes good. You must note the difference between salt. It is to make life comfortable for you. Then in another essence, 
they dip the hand into hot pepper and put it onto your tongue. This one is telling you that in this world, there are going to be problems here and there. You are not going to have it smooth sailing. The world is full of ups and downs. So from the infancy, you are being prepared to face life as a human being. There comes the real naming. Now, before a child is named, there are consultations among members of the family as to the type of name that the child should be given. If there had been an ancestor who was very good and they want to name that child after that ancestor, the family agrees and they give that name so that the child will live up to that name and become like that ancestor. On the other hand, there are names with regard to the day on which you are born. On a Sunday born, if you are a boy, they will, they will call you Kwesi. If you are a girl, they call you Esi or Akuswa. A Monday born, if you are a boy, they call you Kojo. A girl, they call you Ajo. Tuesday, Pabla, Abena. Wednesday, Beku, Bekuya. Thursday, Yao, or Yawa. Friday, Kofi, the girl is Afi Ama. Uh, Saturday, Kwami, Ami, and the rest. Then, there is also another set of names. If God has done something good for you, or if you want peace in your house, you name your child Fafa, which means peace. Selon, God loves me. Seira, God loves me. And a whole lot of names. These are names that you are going to be identified with. You are not just going to be called by any name, but the name that you are given on that day. And the name is not only given, there is normally a drink that today we are adoring you. We are calling you Kofi. And anywhere you hear the name Kofi, respond to it. Your name is Kofi. And all the witnesses around, they serve everybody with that drink. When they serve you, they tell you, this child is called Kofi. You call the child's name and then you see the drink. Everybody does it. Why do you do that? You do that so that you serve as living witnesses to the naming of that child. Somebody will come from outside and say, no, this child is not called Kofi. But once you were there and witnessed the sipping of the drink, you can testify that that child was called Kofi or Abuna or this and that. That is the naming ceremony. So society now knows you as what? The name that you have been given on that day. So after this, there is what we call Mary making. In every African right, the rights do not end without any form of merry making. Because a child has been born into the family, everybody must be happy with that child. So gifts are given to this child. That is our naming ceremony. You we'll read details about it later. Now, when the child is born, <coughs> it is not born to only the father and the mother. It is born into the family. We have what we call the extended family system. If you are born to this gentleman, you are not only for him. You are for the family and you are for the community. 
So the community has to see to it that you behave properly. If you misbehave against somebody in the family, that person has the right to discipline you. That is what holds us together. You don't say, because you don't belong to me, when you are misbehaving, I should see you misbehave. No, it is not part of the Ghanaian. It is not part of the Ghanaian. Community involvement. So, if the child is a thief, it casts a slur on the family. So the family must make sure that that child lives uprightly. And it is the responsibility of all those of you who witness the naming of that child to make sure that that child comes up well. So community involvement, that is one aspect. Then we get to another stage. The child grows, attains adolescence. If the child attains adolescence, it means he is moving from one stage to another stage. That one too, we have rights to usher you into the next stage. And we call them puberty rights. When we talk about puberty rights, we have puberty rights for boys and puberty rights for girls. Now, for the girls, the first sign which shows that you have attained a certain age is your first menstrual period. If you are a parent, especially the mothers, your eyes must be very keen on your daughter so that immediately she reaches that stage you must make sure that you take very good care of that child because it is a stage she doesn't know what to do so that child needs to be taught what to do so when the child's uh, first menses is determined an announcement is going to be made in the community that this girl has come of age the girl is taken away from the home to an isolated village or a camp is built for all those girls within that age range and then they are given special tutorials tutorials in mother motherhood because you are a girl you have to know how to clean yourself, how to shave your armpit, how to take your bath very well. When you are in your menstrual period, the way you have to take care of yourself, all those things are taught you during that camp. Then how to prepare food. You are also taught how to prepare food for yourself, for the family, and the community. So food craft is also taught. Then how to lay bed. Of late there are girls who don't even know how to prepare beds for themselves, their parents or their future husbands. But during this camp everybody is taught. So we call it the puberty right, Vagro in the account setup, depot in the uh, robo area, and then in the Ebe area, we call it Boto Owo. Now, when a child or a woman is in her menses, we, some Ghanaians, believe that the woman is unclean. And because the woman is unclean, that woman has no right to stay in the home with the others. So the woman is taken aside and then treated until she is okay before she is accepted back home. 
So that first menses period is the period to teach you how to handle yourself. Now the, the, the boys, now in the case of the girls, they are also taught some simple crafts. You don't have to depend all the time on your husband. You must learn to work to support your husband. You must learn to do certain things to help the family so that you don't go to a marriage house and say you are depending solely on your husband. No. If your husband fails you, what about the children? Should you allow them to die of hunger? So you, the woman, you are taught very little crafts that you can do to sell, to generate some income for the family. So during this camp period, you are taught all these things. There are certain girls, when you marry them, there are no childbirth. So during the camp, sacrifices are made to open the avenue for childbirth. Because in the Ghanaian society, a marriage without childbirth is frowned upon. We cherish our children so much. So if you are a woman, your pride must be in the number of children you have. So if you are married without children, society frowns upon you. So there are rights prepared to make life meaningful. Then, when this thing is over, the ladies are beautifully dressed and paraded for everybody to see that they have come of age. And this is the time that the men look at the beautiful ladies, well dressed, and then somebody after the ceremony will be proposing that, oh, I would like this lady, I would like this lady, or I will take this one, I will take this one. Now there is one important thing, our dances. We do not play with our dances. During this period, they are taught how to dance. So if you are a Ghanaian girl, they are playing any traditional drum from your area and you don't know how to go about dancing, then it means you have not got the proper training. Those in the cities now are lost just because religion is coming in to say that all these rights are devilish. All these rights are devilish. But they are rights to check immorality. If you don't attain the age of puberty and you are impregnated, you are a social outcast. They throw you out of the family because you are bringing what disgrace to the family. So it keeps our girls as virgins until the age of puberty. After you've gone through puberty rise, then the way is open for you to look for a husband or somebody to look for you. So it is very, very, very important for us. So when you are married, it is not only just seeing you and say, oh, I love this girl, oh, the two of us together. It is a contract between families. It is a contract between families. Why is it a contract? The two of you get together, but it is the family. So before anybody goes into marriage, there must be investigations into the family background. As my colleague had already told you, whether there are diseases, there are, uh, whether there are criminals in that family, there are some families if you marry, your first child will die, the second child will die, would you like to go into that family? No. So all these things are investigated before the marriage is contracted. 
and if the marriage is contracted, it is difficult to break. It is difficult to break. So, we'll read about more concerning our marriages. There are certain things that are done. The drinks are brought, uh, the knocking uh, drink to show that uh, you have seen this girl, uh, I want to marry her. You mention your intention to your parents, then your parents will have to investigate the background of the girl you want to marry. Then you also mention to your parents that I've seen this gentleman, this gentleman has proposed to me. They will also do the investigation. After they are all convinced that the two families can come together, then they move forward and send the marriage dreams. That is marriage. Then we go to uh, the last one. The last one is death. Anything that lives must surely die. And if you die, it is not one person's affair. It involves the entire community. It is our belief that if somebody dies and you are not uh, given that fitting barrier, the ghost of that person will be haunting the family. The ghost of the person will be haunting the family. And it will be a disgrace to the family that a member of the family has passed away and the person is not given a fitting barrier. No matter the circumstances under which you die, the funeral rites have to be prepared for you. So, Ghanaians spend a lot of money in funerals. They buy very expensive coffins because that is the last respect they are giving you. That is the last respect they are giving you. They will not see you again. And death in the Ghanaian sense is just a transition. Movement from the physical world into the spiritual world. And it is believed that that person has not left the scene. His or her spirit is always within. Whatever you are doing, that person is seeing you. But you don't see the person. So if you don't give that person a very fitting barrier, the ghost will be hunting you. So we spend a lot of uh, money organizing funerals, and it is always community-based. There are drumming and dancing. The drumming and dancing do not show merrymaking. There are special songs that are sung during the funeral period. And the dance forms that are done are also different. The, the hand gestures that we see at funerals portray how painful the loss is to the society. So, with this, you will realize that the Ghanaian has very significant rights to mark the various aspects of life on this earth. With that, if anybody has any question, the person can ask the question and then I will explain further. Thank you.
their rights of passage from childhood to adulthood. Uh, and so we have a lot of old boys in the UK. Yeah, uh, in the case of boys, the boy, since you are going to be the head of the family, they need to prepare you very well. In our system, they will provide you with a gun, a hoe, and then a cutlass. The gun, you hunt for game. The hoe and the cutlass, you use in tilling the land. Meaning you have to produce food to do what? To feed the family. And then, you must be seen to have your own building. If you have your own building, it means you are ready to be on your own. Without those things, you are not ready to go in for any woman. Because if any woman comes to you, you will not be in a position to feed the person. You will not be in a position to protect the person. You will not provide accommodation or housing for that person. Then it means you are not ready. And in certain areas, girls assemble. There is what we call wrestling. During this wrestling, the girls are all guarded, and then two boys are put together. If you are defeated in the wrestling, uh, wrestling game, no woman would like to marry you. <laughs> It means when there is trouble, you cannot defend your woman. So all the girls will run away from you. And then the victor will, the girls will be clamoring for that person because he is strong and can protect them. These are some of the things that we do for the girls. Yeah, um, let me quickly add that. <clears throat> um, culture is dynamic, society is dynamic. There are all kinds of complexities coming. Uh, so these days, some of these value systems are within themselves undergoing metamorphosis. Uh, so today, instead of giving a whole a catalyst to your ward, you want to prepare that person to face life by sending that person to school and using your value system to imbue that person with all these things he's talking about. So you see, if you look at the philosophy of our people, those old days, and some of them are still relevant today, you need to prepare that child. And those days, they have to farm. They have to know how to turn off uh, this in the, the li uh, this in the livestock, especially in the north. You know, so those were the things that were relevant at the time. Today, your child has to go to school. You have to teach your child in the home, how to organize the home, especially the boys. How to learn a trade. If you cannot afford to pay school fees, how to learn a trade. If the child and your resources are available, that person goes to school. And every time the person comes back from holidays, you don't allow the boy to just go around roaming. You need to make sure that the child follows some of the accepted norms in the society. You have to make sure that your child does not go and smoke all kinds of herbs you know, and bring trouble onto you. So these are things that you need to do. The, re the reason why we lay special emphasis on the woman or the girl is that, you know, pregnancy, when the men misbehave, is the women who carry it. You know, so pregnancy is a big challenge for the lady. You know, and if the lady is not prepared, adequately prepared for that, it breaks the, 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 the whole physical and psychological, it brings a lot of trauma onto that child. So these days, society is finding modern ways of instilling this same discipline. But the pride of any woman, no matter what, that, what education you have had, is to be, to have an identity. When your people are dancing, you need to know how to dance. You know, you need to know how to greet. There is a long pattern of greeting. When a woman meets an Anglo person, in the former talk, you know, you have to ask of the family and he stress on the essence of the family. You don't see the person just ask of his health and leave. You're asking of the health of his children, the parents, the uncles, everybody. Because that is how our society is structured. 
And there's one also important thing. In, in Ghana, you see, we don't have home for the aged because we are supposed to be within a family. Even that's why we have family homes. Even when I'm tr I've traveled or if I'm not there, my parents have to live in a home, either from their own home or my side. So, and there are provisions within the house to make sure this woman or this old man is cared for, you know. It is different in other cultures. Other cultures are a certain age, they say, home for the aged. We do not have that thing here. People are trying to introduce it, but I don't know whether it's working. But see, the challenge is that if you are a man or a woman, you have to look after your children very well. So that at the end of the day, they also provide for you in your old age. But if you are in quotes, irresponsible, you don't pay school fees for your children, you are interested in marrying plenty of women, at the end of the day, all the women will leave you because you can't be trusted. There are certain religions which allow marriage more than one, two, three, right? But what I'm saying is that even in those circumstances, the man has to be seen to be responsible. The woman has to be seen to be responsible. So certain women, when they bring forth and there are challenges, they go and leave their child with somebody and run away somewhere. One day, that child may not be able to look after you because you have not identified enough with that child to take off you in your old age. So those are some of the systems, but there are things that are changing fast, but we need to keep track. Yes, dear. for you to see life. You see the puberty rights, they perform it for you to see. Uh, the rights for the boys also, they do it for you to see. And at every stage, there is a mark. If a girl has gone through puberty right, there are marks to indicate that you have passed from this stage to another stage. If you don't have that mark, it means your friends will be laughing at you that you have not gone through the proper destiny. But of late, things are changing. So we don't insist on those things. We have institutions in place that can lead you into 
most of these rights. It seems to me that despite so many years of slavery and colonization, that um, there are many, many values that run deep in society. Are there any values that have been forgotten? Because it seems that people have held on to their beliefs, even though they've embraced Western religion. Mm, okay. Yeah, you see, um, in terms of values, you see, the African or the Ghanaian is still a Ghanaian. You know, when I travel and I come back, my children, the first thing is to offer me water. When I drink everything, before I'm away, I'm pouring some on the ground. Though I go to church, I'm a Catholic. But I do those things because they have become part of me. The reason is that I also recognize that if the white man's religion hadn't come, it doesn't mean there's no way I can communicate with God. You know, so those, some of those things, you do them without knowing. Today, if I'm not just permitted to just go and marry any woman, anyhow, you still have your parents, once they are alive, they still have to contract that marriage for you. That's why even in wedding, European wedding, <coughs> you see the family from the woman, the family from the man going together. So the values are there. Now this depot uh, thing we're talking about, where the lady is prepared for marriage. Some people, even when they travel abroad, they come and do it. It depends upon the strength of the family. There are some families, if unfortunately I find myself out of contest with my own traditions, then it carries on through my children. But if I am well, deeply engraved in my own culture, then I carry on with my children. I'm called Michael, but my child, I've called, uh, I called one of them Salom. He tried to explain what Salom means, Selassie, and the one is called Delali. They are all living names. When I was going to baptize them, they asked me their baptismal names. I say I want to maintain those names, which are African names, which have meaning, and they so accepted. So you see, you see a blend of this. But assuming I went and said, well, I want the child to be called something else, they would have done it for me. It depends upon your own beliefs. You know, so there are strengths in certain families. Others, because of their own history, they don't have some of these things. And there are several others. Those days, we were told that when the chief dies, because he's a chief, he has to move into the next world with a retinue. <laughs> what does that mean? It means that a few people are going to be killed to go with him. But those things have changed. Today, if somebody gets lost, it's really between you and the law. You know, so some, a lot of these things are changing. So even when you look through the rites of passage, there are modifications. But again, the pride of a woman is to be, to be seen to have passed through all these rights. But at the end of the day, you are a Ghanaian. When you die, you are even flown from abroad, you'll be buried the traditional way. You know, you'll be given a coin to travel with, some money that because they know you are going to maybe cross rivers, there are certain rights that will be performed. And drinks are very important in you know, all our distance. Uh, these days, people are using Fanta and things, but the essence of the spirit, the spirit, the drink, Alcohol, the essence of it, because it is strong and spiritual, it is believed that it can communicate better with those who are in the unknown world. And so everything that the Ghanaian did at the time had a certain essence. No, but if you look at the philosophy of our elders, there were certain things with solid scientific basis, but because they could not express that, they used some of these myths to cover them. For instance, you are told, not to enter a certain forest. Because when you go there, a samai or ghost or whatever it is will hunt you. The essence was to conserve that forest so that you not, you not dare go there, you know? I mean, so there was nobody who was policing the forest. But the thing is that when you go, something will happen to you, so you don't even go. You don't go to sea on certain days. It's also for conservation, so that you don't deplete the stock in the river or the sea. So these things had scientific basis, but they put it in such a way that it will put fear in people and they will not dare. But today, when you make rules that are enforceable in court, you need somebody to be there to, be, to go and arrest the person. You need somebody to sit in a, a court of law to prosecute and lawyers coming. You know, but 
Our people just said this thing was not tolerated within the society. It was not done, period. You know, so there are scientific reasons, but they carved them in such a way that you yourself, you be the policeman of your own self, you know, so that society doesn't spend time going to hide and find out whether you were trans uh, tra uh, tra trespassing. So these are some of the inbuilt things, and uh, they are changing gradually. Did you hear? I didn't hear. I said, um, you know when you said that the young women got marked, uh, and um, where did they get marked and how did they get marked? Uh, a girl who has gone through puberty ride normally has a mark on the hand or on the arm. That is with the kumbus. But with the avis, there is no mark. With the accounts, there is no mark. But with the Kobos, there are incisions to show that you have gone to this thing. What do you use? Because she's asking, what do you use? Uh, to make the so, oh, they, they normally use knife to make some small mark on you. Yeah, but again, it's changing it's because changing. some people have, uh, when they have those marks, they turn into blisters. So. It's fading away gradually, it's fading away. But some of them will use certain beads. When you see the lady wearing the beads, you know that this lady has uh, gone through the process. Or the way we wear rings, married women, uh, people have had ways of, you know, uh, portraying those things. But the marks are rather fading away because uh, they are 